Facebook.com. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I see the second counter. Hello, and welcome to the NorthJersey.com Sports Show. I'm Abby Mastrocco coming to you live this Thursday night. For those of you who don't know me, I typically cover the New Jersey Devils and baseball, depending on what time of year it is. But tonight we're going to talk about some football, in particular the NFL draft. So we've got a couple guests we're going to welcome in tonight. We've got Art Stapleton, our Giants writer, and Andy Vasquez, our Jets writer. Art, Andy, how are you guys doing? Doing well, Abby. How are you? For, uh... Hosting the program, taking over for the big boss. Andy, how are you? Where are you? You're healthy, right? Yeah, I'm hanging out in Florida with my parents, and it could be worse. So it's it's warm down here at least and getting a little bit of sun. I had a mustache for a while, but that went away. So we'll see how it goes going forward. I'm really bummed that, that that's not here for the show. <laughs> Maybe in a couple weeks. <laughs> Art, how's it going with you? Where are you? We're hanging in here. I'm I'm home in in uh, New York and hanging out and trying to track the between tracking the draft and trying to figure out, you know, two plus two with uh, with my 11 year old daughter. My wife and I are at the Stapleton Academy, trying to uh, get her her degree while we're we're all waiting on a. Uh, you know, better days ahead in the community. So hopefully, you know, wish everyone out there safe and healthy and, you know, have some fun talking some football, right? Awesome. Yeah. It's, you know, something we all miss talking about sports right now. Glad to hear everybody is safe and healthy. We have another guest tonight. It is Matt Hennessy, a center at Temple, hoping to be drafted next week. And he's also a local guy, a Don Bosco guy. Matt, how are you doing tonight? Doing well, doing well. Set up in Rockland County, so uh, just over the border from Don Bosco, but doing well. Awesome. What What has this process been like for you? You prepare for something like this, and then you have sort of a once-in-a-generation event, like a pandemic that has to disrupt just everything. Take us through what happened at the beginning of March to where you are now. Yeah, so, um, I mean, even going back a little further, the, the first part of the process was awesome. Uh, Senior Bowl, Combine, and then... Um, Came back up here in March, uh, in anticipation of Pro Day on March 16th, which got canceled. Um, so from there, I was just trying to figure out what was next in the evaluation process. And then as teams adjusted and decided to move to Zoom calls um, and, and other forms of video calls, that's uh, how it's been going since then. So just banging out a bunch of those every day and uh, getting ready for the draft next week. How many Zoom calls have you have you done? How many are you doing a day, would you say? Um, uh, usually two, one or two. Um, Probably about 19 to 20 total over the past, uh, whatever it is, two or three weeks. What's that process been like for you? Do you feel like teams are able to get a good feel for you? And, and conversely, you're able to get a good feel for the teams just based on video calls? I think so, um, especially talking with the personnel people when they're just trying to gather info. Uh, same with coaches and get to know who you are. Um, that part of the process has been kind of uninterrupted. Um, like, of course, you'd love to meet them in person. But uh you know, for now, Zoom Zoom is what it is. And then as far as talking scheme with coaches, it's a little bit more difficult through the screen considering some things are flipped. But uh, but that's also been uh, pretty much business as usual. How have you been able to stay in shape during this? I know that you probably aren't used to having, you probably don't have the same workout facilities that you're used to having. What are you doing to keep yourself in shape leading up to your first workouts? Yeah, I, uh, I totally lucked out because one of my childhood friends up in Clarkstown has a, a garage gym set up that has everything I need. So I've been able to uh, consistently train throughout this process. It's just been great. That's awesome. Good to hear. Uh, I believe Art and Andy have a couple questions for you as well. Maybe let's start with Art. Hey, Matt. Uh, obviously, it's great to have you tonight. We appreciate you doing this. Um, just, just curious. I mean, I know we talked at the Combine, the idea of when you first thought of being in the NFL, and it goes back to your Don Bosco days. I'm just curious, that kind of experience and what that did for you to kind of change your perspective maybe on what kind of football player you could be. Yeah, so uh, so going back to Don Bosco, playing against the Calberf competition we played was uh, was definitely the factor that allowed me to realize that uh, 
someday I could play at the highest level. And um, at the time, it you know it didn't didn't always go my way. Uh, high school, there, there's huge talent disparity. Some guys are more developed. But uh, just competing against those guys really opened my eyes and, and made me see that I could play the Division One level and then from there move on the NFL, perhaps. Do Do you have a favorite memory or, or something that stands out from your time at Don Bosco and? Uh, is there one moment or are there several moments or, or what, what kind of comes to mind when you think back to that time? Um, so it's, it's a cross between, uh, between being out there in July and August and running through injury yard shuttles and, uh, and then eventually winning the state championship my senior year. So I'd come there just after my brother graduated and he had won four state championships there um, from 2008 to 2012 and two national championships. They didn't lose a game. Freshman year, uh, played on the freshman team, so I was on the varsity, but kind of hit this dry spell where didn't didn't win a state championship for three years, and then eventually my senior year we were able to bring it back, which was uh, absolutely unbelievable. Matt, I know uh, you know there are a lot of interested teams in you and your services wherever you're going to end up going in the draft, uh, but I do know that there is a team close to your heart. Whether or not that factors into this process remains to be seen, but. Lifelong Giant fan, right? I mean, uh, it's got to be a little weird to to think that there is a chance, whatever percentage it may be, that the Giants are the team on the end of the line calling you, letting you know that you're going to be a part of Big Blue next week. Tell me about your fandom. Who's your favorite player? When it, what do you remember from growing up a Giants fan? Yeah, so actually uh, just moving back into my childhood home, um, following college kind of in this middle period before uh, leaving for a team, um, been able to clean out the house a little bit and actually found some some old tickets dating back as far as maybe 2003. Um, so we're, we're season ticket holders in the old stadium. And then when they moved to the new one, uh, we, we hit games when we could. But um, I mean, so, some of my favorite memories, uh, certainly the two Super Bowls. Uh, uh, those are two of my best childhood memories uh, overall. Uh, we, were, we were quite super fans in my family. Um, and, then, and then some fun we did actually is a uh, when when Cowboys Stadium opened in maybe it's 2009 the new one um, that opening night Sunday night game versus the Giants my mom actually flew us down there so we uh, we sat there we got to see Lawrence Signs at the game winner it was awesome Matt we actually have a question from a reader uh, somebody wants to know what was it like to play for Matt Patricia the Detroit Lions coach in the Senior Bowl what are some things you might have learned from him. He was awesome. So uh, the Senior Bowl is such a unique experience because uh, it's this it's this huge huge evaluation period, but at the same time you're you're uh, being coached by an NFL staff. Uh, so so sitting in team meetings, uh, unit meetings, and then position meetings with the Lions staff was incredible. Um, and Coach Patricia was awesome to play for there. So Matt, I know you grew up a Giants fan, but you're for those people who don't know, your brother plays for the Jets. Uh, he's a long snapper. Just would it be first of all would it be weird growing up a Giants fan to, to if you got drafted by the Jets to play with them and what would it be like uh, to play with your brother and have you let yourself think about that and have you guys talked about that at all? Yeah, so as far as um, like playing for the Jets, it being weird having grown up a Giants fan, um, it's not like not too much of a thing for me just because once I really realized, uh, I guess in the last two years that I could play in the NFL. Um, my fandom for any team really dissipated because uh, I knew I could end up playing against the, the Giants or playing for them. So I didn't know what would happen. So um, for, for the past two years, I haven't really followed an NFL team. Like I'll watch the games. But uh, so so on that end, um, wouldn't be like too much of a factor. But then the, the opportunity to play with my brother would be incredible. Um, it's something we talked about, something we wanted to have happen. Uh, maybe in college, we were four years apart, so I couldn't do it in high school, but maybe college uh, overlap for a year, but never got to do it. So uh, the opportunity to do that would be would be awesome. Matt, when, when you uh, are meeting with teams and you, even going back to the combine, but also through this process with the, the video conferences, what do you want them to know about Matt Hennessy? What kind of player are you? Can you give us a scouting report? And why should a team you know, pick you next week to kind of be their center of the present and the future? Yeah, I think it starts with uh... – with making an impression that I'm a true professional and um, like from, from day one, that's who I'm going to be in the organization. And, um, and, then, and then what else they're able to figure out through these zoom calls is hopefully uh, when we start to go through football stuff, 
understand my football IQ and know that I'm capable of handling uh, all the center or potentially guard responsibilities at the next level. We have another reader question. Uh, who is the toughest player you've ever played against and why at any level? Yeah, so um, throughout my time at Temple, I was able to play against some good ones. Played against Ed Oliver in 2017 um, and, and a number of different first or second rounders along the way. But the toughest player, actually, uh, it's funny that we're on this because it was actually somebody who I played against when I was at Don Bosco. Um, my junior year, second week, we played a game up at West Point against St. Thomas Aquinas. And Nick Bosa was the defensive end at the time. I was playing right tackle. And he was, without a doubt, the best player I played against. You guys are wondering, just overall, how, how strange is this situation? Because next week your life is going to change. You're going to get drafted. And you, you're probably like, are you, do you know, do you go where the team is right now? Do you stay? Have you thought about that? Uh, what kind of happens after that? And how strange is it to, you know, you're going to start your life potentially in a new city, but you're not sure if you'll be going there at first. How, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, it is kind of strange because you always anticipate getting drafted and then reporting for rookie minicamp a week or two later. But uh, I guess it looks like I'll be posted up here for a while in New York. Um, so really, once I get drafted, I just want to figure out the quickest way to uh, start learning the playbook. It looks like it's all going to be through through video calls, video conferences for now. And then uh, get on the team strength program as well. Have you been asked anything sort of out of left field or pretty strange in any of your Zoom calls with teams? Um, no, I actually haven't. Um, I've been asked like that question a, a, quite a few times because I think um, some of the other people like throughout the, the pre-draft process get asked those questions. But um, no, I haven't really. No, nothing's really uh, been too weird. A reader wants to know who was your favorite player growing up? Um, I think Justin Tuck, uh, growing up a Giants fan. And then I just became old enough to get a better understanding of of how the game worked um, right when he was coming into his prime with the Giants. Um, I always loved watching the Giants defensive lines play, and uh, and he, he was one of my favorites. I know I made this joke with you the other day when we talked, Matt, but, you know, Justin Tuck carried on through the NFL, two-time Super Bowl champ, went on to a world in finance. Well, I know you got your degree in your back pocket. I, sh I would assume you would not mind following in the footsteps of Justin Tuck uh, and then ultimately kind of moving into that finance world, I don't know, 10, 15 years down the road. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, and it's so cool to see you guys taking, taking advantage of life after football like that. Well, Matt, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Good luck in the next step and stay safe, stay healthy. All right. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Next, we're going to move into some more team-specific stuff. Uh, the draft is a week away. We've got a new coach for the Giants. The Jets, of course, have needs. Um, let's start with Art. What do you think the Giants' biggest needs are going into the draft right now? Well, how long we got, Abby? How long we stay in? <laughs> um, you know, the Giants. Yeah. What should they target in the first round? Let's let's start. I got you. Um, <laughs> you know, they're picking in the top ten for the fifth time in six seasons, and that pretty much speaks to. Uh, their inability to kind of find some solid ground, solid footing after Tom Coughlin left. They had one playoff season, and then they've really been buried ever since. Um, the two spots you're going to look at for the Giants is do you get a defensive playmaker uh, like an Isaiah Simmons from Clemson, the hybrid linebacker safety, or do you invest in the offensive line? It seems like it's a broken record for the Giants, probably dating back to 2012. Uh, and then you would zero in on four offensive tackles in that spot at four. But there's also a chance for a little bit of a trade back. And I think that's what Dave Gettleman and the rest of the Giants front office would like to do. Uh, and not too far, but maybe trade back with a Miami or an L.A. Chargers who might be coming up for a quarterback uh, and pick up a draft asset and then maybe go for one of those offensive tackles uh, and, and build something in front of Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Look, you've made the investment in Jones and Barkley. Now build the wall in front of them and, and see if you can really get this offense going under a new offensive coordinator and Jason Garrett. 
uh, and maybe kind of build something like the Cowboys have in Dallas with that that offensive line, which is uh, loaded with resources. Andy, same question. What's the Jets' biggest need? I know an edge rusher has got to be at the top of their list. Is that something they can get in the draft? Well, it's always at the top of the Jets' list, edge rusher, it seems like, since the mid-2000s. But um, I think the, the two biggest things they need right now, it's going to be a choice between offensive line, offensive tackle, one of those top four guys, and wide receiver. Uh, Joe Douglas, in his first full offseason as the Jets' GM, he did a nice job of rebuilding the offensive line. There's still a lot of holes there. There's still a lot of issues. Um, but the depth is so much better than it was last year that it's hard to not imagine it being much better uh, as a unit. And that's not a high bar to set because the offensive line was terrible last year. So they could get away with drafting a wide receiver at number 11 if a guy like C.D. Lamb or Jerry Judy is there. Um, I think that's something they've got to take a serious look at. But I think if they have you know, one of their tackles they have highly graded that's still there, a Wurfs, a Becton. If one of those guys is still there, I don't see, unless it's the very bottom guy on their list, I don't see how they pass him up just because the need at offensive line is so big and the offensive line has struggled for the last few years now and they need to protect Sam Donald. But then they have to get a wide receiver too because after Robbie Anderson left in free agency, the position is – is weak. It's a big question mark. The only proven receiver on the roster right now is Jameson Crowder and everybody else is a question mark. You don't know if Quincy Anun was going to be able to even play next year. So there's a lot of issues. And then, yeah, at some time, at some point I would think in this, and they, it could be as high as the second round or anytime after they got to get an edge rusher and they desperately need a cornerback too. And I could keep going. So there's a lot of work for Joe Douglas to do in his first draft uh, as Jets GM. And it's going to be really fascinating to see how he deals with that, uh, conundrum at the top. What have your biggest impressions been of Joe Douglas so far? What, what's what's your takeaways? What's he like? What's his demeanor? I think in press conferences, he has a very clear vision. Uh, he's not afraid to say what his goals are. And uh, he's good at explaining how he wants to get there. He talks about wanting to have the best culture in sports. And I know it sounds cliche, but I think it's something like he says around the building a lot and he's taking action to do it. Um, and he also... I liked some of the things he did in free agency in terms of keeping them under the cap, uh, which gives them some flexibility moving forward if they want to make a trade during the season for a player that's there and, and trying to get guys on smart deals, which is very unjets like over the past few years. They, you know, last offseason they signed Le'Veon Bell and uh, CJ Mosley, and neither one of those guys, Mosley was hurt all year. Bell had the worst season of his career. It, it's really hard to quick fix a team in free agency. So I, it, it's all going to depend on if the, he's trying to build around depth, solid depth. And if the depth he got is solid and good, then it can work because you can add some pieces to bolster that. But if it, it's not, then you've got issues because you don't have depth. Art, Joe Judge, what's he been like? What kind of influence <laughs> is he going to have the next couple of weeks? Well, I think it's between Joe and his uh, six-year-old family dog, coincidentally also named Abby. So uh, maybe I'm not in tribute to you. How is it spelled? <laughs> it's uh, it's not like you. It doesn't have the e. Oh, not after um, the road. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean we had a lot. We, we had some fun with that yesterday. You know, Joe Judge working out of the basement uh, of his home in Massachusetts. You know, his family was in the process at the end of the combine of moving back. Uh, moving down to North Jersey. They were kind of settled down here. He has four kids. Uh, his oldest son is getting ready for high school. So he was looking at a lot of schools in the area. And then obviously on the heels, you know, the beginning of March when they felt like they were going to finally kind of make a permanent move down here, um, all everything kind of hit with, with the coronavirus. So um, they are, he's working in Massachusetts. So that just speaks to the, the idea of you're the head coach and you can't, you're not even in the facility where you're working. Uh, but look, I think the big thing for Joe Judge is, is don't be Belichick Jr. I think a lot of people who, who look at the Belichick staff uh, up in New England and when coaches get hired, Matt Patricia, you know, when Josh McDaniels left, uh, I think there's a lot of feeling of what happens when that guy comes. They try to be Belichick, and that doesn't work. Um, I do like the fact that Joe Judge is pretty consistent in his message. Uh, and if he's consistent in his message with us in the media, 
I think that means that's going to translate being consistent in his message uh, with his players. The thing about Judge that everyone's kind of jumped on is they think some people think it's crazy. Some people think he's just, you know, just being a foolish coach, but he hasn't mentioned one player on the Giants by name since he got the job. Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, no one. And his philosophy is the idea that he doesn't want to set expectations on players until he gets them out on the field in the practice facility and works them out and gives them an opportunity to kind of show him and his coaches what they are all about. You know, he said, I don't want to form an impression on a player uh, that performed under a former coaching staff. I don't know the reasons why that player performed that way. Some people don't like it. It's a little weird that he won't talk about the franchise cornerstones of this team, but I do like the fact that he's remained consistent uh, and has not gone off and, and talked about any of the guys that he's going to coach. Uh, ultimately, let's see if they get back on the, get on the field first. Uh, now he gets to talk to them on the computer. Okay, that's a little bit of an unconventional approach. You're right. Okay, so one more for each of you. Who are you picking in the first round for each team? Let's start with Art since the Giants have the higher pick. Yeah, uh, I think uh, talking about Joe Judge, another thing that he mentioned was the idea of, you know, it's a different world this offseason preparing for the draft. And the idea is that teams weren't at pro days and they weren't allowed to bring prospects to their facility and check them out and talk to them and kind of dig in on who they are personally. So he spent a lot of time relying on relationships that he's built through the years. And one of his mentors is Nick Saban at Alabama. And if the Giants are going to take an offensive tackle at number four, uh, I believe it's going to be Jedrick Wills Jr., uh, the tackle from Alabama. My only concern with Wills is the idea that he's only played right tackle. Uh, and ultimately, they're going to want a player, you would think, in the top five to, to eventually play left tackle when Nate Solder uh, is no longer on the team, which could be as soon as next season, depending on his contract. Um, so I, I think they go Wills. I think uh, Dave Gettleman may be tempted to go elsewhere, but I think the Giants have shown since Joe Judge got the job that as much as Dave Gettleman has a say in what's going on, I think they will defer in some sense to Joe Judge. That's why I think Wills will be with the Giants uh, come next Thursday night. Andy, who are the Jets taking? Well, they have a tough, like I said before, they got a tough situation there and a tough choice. I think it comes down to if one of their top two tackles is on the board, and, and I would think it's got to be Wills or Becton. If one of those two guys is there, they, they have to take them no matter what the situation is. And then if, if both those guys are gone um, or whoever their top two tackles are, those are just the the two that I believe are the two best in the draft. Then you got to start looking at wide receiver. Uh, and and I love CD Lamb, and I think he'd be a great fit for the Jets. I think if you'd be plugging in a weapon that Sam Darnold can have for the next, you know, eight, nine years, and and the kind of playmaker that this offense just doesn't have, a inside, outside type of guy who would make a big difference. And, and obviously there'd be no more excuses for Adam Gase when you have a playmaker like that in your offense. You have your quarterback and an upgraded offensive line. But I think – I think they're going to go with an offensive tackle no matter what. And my, I think it's probably going to be Tristan Wirfs at 11. Uh, I think that's – it's a safe pick, but it's understandable because if they swing and miss on a wide receiver there, which is more likely to happen at that stage in the draft, uh, it's something that's going to be very hard for this team to recover from because they have so many holes in the roster. So I think they'll go with the offensive tackle. I'd like to see them take the wide receiver, but I don't think it's going to happen. Well, guys, thanks for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. I know I keep saying it, but can you really say it too much in a situation like right now? Nope. Nope. Thanks, Abby. It was great catching up you with too. you guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for doing this. We'll be back next week. There's still plenty of sports to talk about, even in a pandemic. Things are a little strange right now, but hey, this seems a little bit normal talking about sports, doesn't it? Until then, I'm Abby Mastraco. Thanks for tuning in.